All right. Hey, first time on the show. Always wanted to have you on. Parker Fleming. You know him on Twitter. Stats O War. And Parker, you know, I, I cannot tell you. Uh, it's got to be over probably 50 people that I've turned on to your Twitter account because it's one of the best out there. You do all kinds of stats and, and info and graphics. I mean, your graphics are, are out of this world. They're the best out there during college football and offseason as well. But really during college football time, I can't imagine the engagement you have. So really appreciate you jumping on with me. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. My, I always get a little follower bump whenever you retweet something of mine. So I always appreciate that. And I think of you and Shane is, uh, I think highly of both of you guys and, and love hearing you. And um, I, I think you guys have a similar mindset as me is I, too many people take themselves too spirit, too seriously. College football is fun. We can do good work, do good analysis and still have fun and antagonize and play around. And I feel like you guys have that vibe just absolutely down. So I'm, I'm delighted to be a guest. I, I'm a big fan of y'all's too. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Parker, but I because I think the first time that I had stumbled upon you was um, I, I'm trying to think back the year. This would have been when Georgia ran through the entire SEC. They were undefeated. They were a big favorite to face Alabama in the SEC championship. And and to my recollection, your model, your numbers, even though everybody was picking Georgia again, this was their first national championship year, which they ended up winning the national championship. But you broke down the SEC championship and and your model had Alabama as the winner, which was pretty stunning. And, and you nailed it. Do I have that correct? And do you recall all that? Yeah, I think that was fall of 2021. So I think what happened was. 2019, I started, I was really covering TCU for an SB Nation site called Frogs of War. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a super huge number nerds. And, and so I was kind of thinking, all right, how do I evaluate TCU's opponents? Well, I have some ideas about what, what is important, but I have to, you know, adjust that for opponent. Then I have to adjust what the opponents do. And, and pretty soon you have a 130 person model. And I think fall of 2020 was the first time I started doing those one, those kind of one single game cards, those game sheets um, that I post out there. And they didn't even have a score prediction. I kind of got bullied into putting a score prediction out there. Um, and I was only doing a couple games every week and and got enough traction that I finally said, OK, I'm going to post all the games. I'll put a score prediction there. So the model was actually kind of a secondhand uh, thought for me because I just wanted a single game reference where I could look and have a good idea of what to watch for. So for the big matchups, you can go really deep on them. But you know, for Central Michigan and Buffalo playing each other, I can have a quick look and say, hey, what, what are the relative strengths? What should I watch for here? And so 2021 was the first full season. I posted all of that stuff out there. Um, and yeah, that was a, that was a big weekend uh, for for engagement, for sure. I mean, part of this is, you know, and we'll talk about that a little bit today, but part of it is I, I just have a consistent system. I put the numbers in the system. It comes out. I think it's generally pretty good. We can disagree with it and that's OK. But um, it is it is just a good way to kind of understand football with a coherent system and say, you know, this is what's important. This is how we put it together. And this is the output. Where does that get a start? I, you, you know, as well as I do that, the best way to get a right answer is to write the wrong answer down. And I've had games where I've disagreed and said, hey, I think the model doesn't account for this explicitly. And I've been right. I've also had games where I've said that and been very wrong and should have trusted the numbers. So it cuts both ways. But yeah, I think that was 2021 was kind of the first full season of posting these things out there. Yeah. And before we get into uh, maybe a brief uh summation of how you, you you get to these win totals and everything. I'm just curious because I, I can only imagine how many thousands of times someone at you know, they're, they're, they they come directly at you, not the model, you. Why do you have this? Why do you disrespect insert my team? How often do you get that, especially during the regular season? Oh, a ton. And I, my, my favorite thing to do is just quote tweet. You'll see me do it all the time, probably too much. And I'll, I'll just quote tweet and say, I made them up to make you angry. That's that's all I'm doing here. Uh, yeah, I get a lot. I actually, this is kind of silly because like it, it doesn't really matter, but it is just annoying. I close my DMs just because if you're going to call me a name, you should have to do it in public. Like I'm not going to scroll through my DM requests for you to call me some terrible four letter name and insult me and all that stuff. You got to throw, you got to put that by your name. You got to put that on the timeline. So yeah. All right, so how does your model get to these numbers? And again, I know these are kind of early. Uh, these are not finalized. We've got a long time till we get to the college football season. But you got all 16 SEC teams. You've got a uh, projected win. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have the losses here. And also what is confusing and, and just kind of, uh, uh, you know, Shane and I's minds cannot crack. Uh, how do you get to like a Georgia, for instance, 10.3? Not 10 and 2, 10.3. You got the decimals here. Uh, our, our brains do not compute that. 
Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it is really, really, it, it's really, really simple and straightforward. So one big picture, my model for projecting a matchup for that gets me the scores for those games is going to take kind of four things into account and, and put those together. There's facets to it, but we can summarize it with four things. One, how how good on you on, on early downs, uh, specifically in the pass game? That's going to matter a whole lot, right? Because, you know, Alabama can line up against New Mexico State and run the ball absolutely over them. But we don't think that's necessarily going to translate when they play Georgia, right? So we want to know what you can do in the passing game on early downs. That's a really big indicator of success. Uh, I want to know your run pass mix. So how dependent are you on rushing and passing? And then I want to know how much of your success comes from late downs. There's a couple of teams that stand out to me. 2021 Baylor, for instance, that went and won the Sugar Bowl. A lot of close wins, a lot of kind of fluky fourth down late laid down success that wasn't you know necessarily sustainable um and, and then fourth fourth on that i adjust uh, for opponent so there's that's that's more of an art than a science there's not you know a, a clear tried and true way to adjust for opponent but we can basically say i have some priors i have some ideas about what the team is and then i can observe what happens and i can put all that stuff in a matrix run some algorithms on it and say all right how do all these points relate to each other um and so that's how i kind of get those game previews they update over you know over time as we get more games but going into the season you you need a prior you know you hear some people say oh i don't like preseason polls they shouldn't come out till season four or whatever uh, or till week four or whatever uh and some people punt early season analytics entirely they say it's too hard a problem i'm just gonna wait till we have some data i've done some research that, that's shown that college football teams stabilize about five or six games into the season so about five or six games of the season you generally know what kind of team you're playing with now injuries variance opponent quality can all matter there but um so, so it is it is kind of an uncertain thing early on. The, the way I do that and, and, and why I like having priors is if you don't have any priors, then what you assume is that every team is the same going into the season. We know that's dumb. That's not true. You, you, you can't assume Georgia and Vanderbilt are going to be the same team at the beginning of the season and then just update with more data. I think that's beyond laughable, right? And so how I've done priors here is I've taken the output from that play level model that I talked about with, with early downs and all of that. Um, and then I've taken... The Bill Conley's returning production, because I'm happy to outsource that to him. I don't want to grind through the rosters, and I trust his work there. Um, I've taken some recent history of a team to get an idea of generally what they are. And what's kind of key and novel about this that's fun and will definitely get updated as we have more returning production and as I tinker with it is I have a, uh, a transition matrix. And all that means is I have you know uh, some probabilities that tell me how often a team who was uh, elite, good, average, poor, below average, like those kind of categories there. How often do those teams become good, elite, average, poor the next season, right? So kind of how to, you know, teams that are in one state, how do they move from state to state, season to season? Because we know in college football, there's a lot of stickiness year to year, right? Returning production captures some of that. And so all I did here is I, I put these teams in buckets, right? So I said, are you elite? Are you better than 10 points above average? Are you good? Are you better than five points above average? Are you above average zero to five, below average zero to negative five? Poor is, is lower than negative five. I slap that matrix of transition probabilities on there and say, what's the probability for this range of outcomes that you're going to have? So for Georgia, right, they're elite last year. They I, I still had them power rated number one at the end of the season, right? An elite team, mostly you know, we think they're going to be elite again this year, given the returning production, given how teams transition year over year. But there is some probability that they're only going to be good. And so what I do there is just slap that that elite label on them. And I give a, a, a percentage weight to the elite rating, a percentage weight to the good rating, a, good, a percentage weight to the below uh, average rating, which is super small, like that doesn't really ever happen, that. And then I get a an updated power rating that I'm going to go into the season. And I'm going to abandon that really quickly. Like we're going to phase that out as we get games, but it's a, it's a good starting point. It kind of helps ground everything. And so all I did with that was did that for every team, got this, got this power rating that kind of reflects, all right, given how often a team that's elite becomes elite and becomes good, what do I think your power rating this year is going to be? And then I just simulated the schedule. Uh, all the way through. And so all, all, all this is, is just kind of a quick and dirty back of the napkin, uh, back of the envelope, rather, uh, math exercise to kind of understand the, the expected cal uh, quality of teams. To get, you know, 10.3 wins, what I do is I go through and assign a win probability based, again, on historical distributions of games, what we know about how college football outcomes behave and when two teams are rated in certain ways. And that gives me a zero to one. 
right? So if Georgia has a 66% win probability to beat Alabama, that's a 0.66 win. I give them credit for 0.66 expected wins. I sum all those up and that's where you see these win totals. So I'm a little bit more conservative right now than I am in season for how I assign win probabilities because there's more uncertainty. And so that's why you see Georgia at the top of this list at, at only 10.3, whereas in reality, they're, they're probably going to be favored in every game. And so I'm just a little more conservative here. Keep that spread of win probability a little bit closer to get us a good idea of, you know, who's who's good, how strong is their schedule and, and what would we expect to see out of them this season? Five mm -hmm. minute ran over. I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so again, no surprise at all. You got Georgia at the top of your list. Anybody that doesn't have Georgia at their top of their list, whether it's, you know, there's data or not, there it's a invalid list in my opinion. But it is kind of surprising. Ten point three. I mean, that's that's closer to ten than it is eleven. And Georgia, to my recollection, has not lost a regular season game in three football seasons. I I realize that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the upcoming season. But do you think that is? Mostly a factor to games at Alabama, at Texas, at Ole Miss, and then throw in Tennessee late in the schedule. You know, four potentially really good teams on on Georgia's, and we could throw Clemson in there as well. I don't know how good Clemson's going to be, but is is this a factor of the schedule more than anything you think with Georgia? Yeah, I mean, it speaks to the testament of their schedule. They do have a legitimately tough schedule, um, especially with those threes. The Ole Miss and Tennessee back to back is really, really tough. And we could do an, an exercise there, right? So, like zero to one, not holding you to it. What what win probability do you give Georgia at Alabama? Uh, I mean, I'd probably give it a something like you said, seven out of ten. Okay, a seven. What about Georgia at Tennessee? At well, the game's in Athens, right? But oh, excuse me, at at Texas, I saw the T. My bad. At Texas, yeah. At Texas, probably five and a half. Okay, point five five, and then at uh, at Ole Miss, probably uh, six and a half. Okay, and then Tennessee at home. No, I hate to say it, nine out of ten. <laughs> nine out of ten. Okay, I love that. So right there, Mike, in those four games. You expect Georgia to win all four. You've predicted them as the favorite in all four mm -hmm. of those. But with the probabilities, what that does is gives a level of uncertainty there. And so on those three, I'm adding because I can't do math on my own. Um, you've actually projected two, 2.8 wins on out of those four games, even though Georgia's favorite in all of those. Because we know right. a 70% chance is not 100%. And so that's where you see is like those are real four really hard games. I'd expect if I had to go money line, I'd go Georgia with all four of those, right? But because the probability differs, because that um, Ole Miss game is harder, that Alabama game is harder, those probabilities are smaller. So my confidence that Georgia is going to win is a little bit smaller. So 10.3, you add those up and say, yeah, it's it's a higher probability that Georgia loses one of those Alabama, Texas, uh, or, or two of those Alabama, Texas, Ole Miss, Tennessee, because your your win probabilities are actually kind of closely aligned with, with what my priors have right now. Um, and, and only projecting 2.8 wins out of those because the uncertainty is so high. Right. And, and going a step further, Parker, I mean, I, I realize there's no way to kind of analyze this. This is complete unknown, but um, we are, we're going into a 12 team model. We're going into a, a model in the SEC with no divisions. So who knows? I mean, we could get in a scenario where that Tennessee game in Athens, I mean, that could be do or die for Tennessee. It could mean nothing to Georgia. They could be undefeated. Yeah. They could lose that game by one point, and they're probably still top three, four in the country, and they're going to go to the playoff. They're probably going to go to the SEC championship. And again, I don't. I know there's no way to factor any of that stuff in, but I, I mean, that's probably a poor example. Maybe Georgia Tech. You know, last game of the. I mean, imagine if they just sat Carson Beck because they're like, well, we don't want to get him hurt for the SEC championship. He's still going to play four more games. Yeah. Why are we, why are we going to throw him out there and let Georgia take an a Georgia Tech in a rivalry game, take a shot at him or something. Right. Like that. I think that's absolutely on the table. I think we might see that. Um, and, and, and that's absolutely something to, to factor in. I, I I've kind of said that with talking to Texas and Oklahoma fans as they've moved over. And I've said, guys, you got to recalibrate nine and three is a really good season now, just with the schedule that you have the age of, you know, everybody going 12 and oh, and, and making the, making the playoff. That's, that's kind of over. Most teams in, in these new two super conferences are going to have to understand you're going to take some losses here. So I think that's absolutely true. And, 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 and even if the numbers aren't explicitly baking that in, I think that's something we're going to have to factor in as we look at this this season mm -hmm. so uh, second well technically you got two teams tied here at 10.1 but let's focus on the first one first uh missouri 
10.1. That's why I'm drinking out of this glass here, Parker. I mean, uh, we are fully on the on the Mizzou bandwagon here, but I don't know if you saw it. Some people thought it was ridiculous, but I predicted on Paul Feinbaum's show, I think Georgia and Missouri, that's my SEC championship game right now. And I'm not necessarily saying Missouri is the second best team in the SEC. I, I don't think they're that far off. I think they could be one of the top three offenses in the SEC, but it's more about their path. They go to Alabama. They host Oklahoma. They go to a and M. I mean, it, I I think it's disappointing if Missouri wins, you know, less than 10 games this season, given their schedule, given what they've got coming back. And your model certainly likes them at 10.1 here. Yeah, absolutely. Especially uh, beneficial, kind of in that same exercise we talked about with win probabilities earlier. I mean, Murray State, Buffalo, Boston College, Vanderbilt, you know, that's uh, UMass. That's close to five solid wins. Missouri's high 90s in all of those, right? Should should absolutely win those games. So they have a high base. And then, yeah, you get Texas A&M early, which I think is good. I expect Texas A&M to improve over the course of the season. But early on is going to be a little bit uh, more back and forth. You get Auburn in Columbia. You get Oklahoma in Columbia. South Carolina, you know, hasn't has an historic been been too rough there mississippi state um you know and, and arkansas to end the season that's not a hard slate outside of those two games of you know going to uh going to alabama and going to college station you'd rather go to college station early anyway so they could they could very easily go um 10 and 2 there and i think they're favored over texas a&m in the power ratings right now which is why they're over that 10 win hump so absolutely missouri has a a, a much better path that being said here's here's one where I'll, I'll i'll disagree with the numbers i think missouri hit pretty close to a ceiling last year i mean that's that is about as good as you can ask for given the recent history of missouri football and they lost defensive coordinator um i'm a little bit worried uh, uh about that that would that would be more worrisome to me than the path is okay what if it was one year magic with with luther burden at the oise there what if brady cook can't hold up to the load what if the defense takes a big drop off that's that's what kind of worries me here but missouri does have it uh very nice uh very nice approach here especially if they can survive uh some of those early games and and i mean alabama, uh, alabama and oklahoma it's nice to get a break in between those two i think if you split those missouri sitting pretty is one of the favorites in the sec right and again a shout out to uh your twitter stats of war i mean i, I saw a mizzou fan it was what was it early this week? They said Missouri's gonna be the most underrated team in the country. You said, yeah. My God, they won eleven games last year. Yeah, I think it's most improved. It's like, what are you what, how how much are you gonna improve, man? They're gonna they're gonna cure cancer this fall too? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> All right, how about so te they're technically tied with Texas. Texas ten point one as well. How and again, there's no way to answer this really, but how difficult is it to uh you know, because because they've never gone through an SEC slate. I, I get it. Everybody loves their roster. They love Sarkeesian as a play caller. Uh, the, the schedule breaks out well for them as well. But uh, how how difficult is it to to project what they're going to do with with teams they've never faced? Yeah, the level of adjustments is hard, and and I you know it, it, there is some some reality of how are they going to face back to back opponents and and do this. You look at they've got Red River and Georgia back to back. That's that's a that's a hair on your chest moment for for Texas. We're gonna know uh, who they are, absolutely. But it does break kind of nice. Even some of these tricky games, and I don't know that Florida is necessarily tricky, especially at home. But you go Vanderbilt, Florida, Arkansas, Kentucky, and then and then at Texas A and M to end there. So um, I, I think Texas' season here is you know survive the Michigan game. They they, they should win that game. Um, take care of business in the non-con, get your solid first uh, conference win in, in Mississippi State. You have a familiar opponent in Oklahoma. And then as long as you don't die against Georgia, you're looking at cruising to that Texas A&M game with nothing on the line, right? If they can, the, the, I think Texas's goal is do not be in a position to have one or two losses headed into that Texas A&M game where they can spoil your SEC and playoff <laughs> bid because that has that has bad karma written all over it, right? So I think that's really really important there for for Texas is to take care of business early so that their entire season is not riding on uh, going to going to Kyle Field and and having to deal with that in November. And, and as a TCU guy, I know you can speak to the level of hatred for the Longhorns. Um, I, how do you anticipate that translating to the SEC? Because I, I can tell you, everybody hates them over here too, but may, maybe to a different degree than, than the in-state schools. Obviously, A&M, they're in-state as well. But, I'm t I mean, I'm just thinking Georgia, Alabama, Mizzou. I mean, go down the list, Tennessee. They, they all hate Texas, and, and they barely ever play them. 
Yeah, I, I think that um, it, it kind of worked out well for fire, uh, stoking the fires of rivalry that Texas did so well last year because everybody got to see what peak Texas fan looks like. Um, and, I, and I do think it'll be fun. I mean, I've gone and, uh, you know, I, you can do this in any SEC stadium. I've been yelled at. Guy swung at me when I was down, down there. You know, what? like whatever. People are people are crazy. That's not unique to Texas fans. But um, it, it'll be interesting to see because it really does feel like my entire experience with the Texas fan base has been one of kind of, you know, you know, they think TCU's beneath their station and TCU's beating them and they are mad. I mean, just absolutely <laughs> mad about it. They changed the Thanksgiving scheduling, Mike, because TCU was going down there and beating them every year on Thanksgiving. They didn't want to do it anymore. And so um, I, I think that Texas fans are absolutely ready for the SEC. I, I think it'd be really good for for emotional health in Austin if, if they can put up, you know, eight or nine wins and not completely bottom out here uh, this first season, just because there is a lot of bravado coming into this. Um, I think Texas, Texas A&M is going to be one of the craziest atmosphere games that we've seen in a long time. And I'm excited for that as a college football fan. I think that's good. That's a rivalry that should be played. Um, would encourage everybody to be smart and have fun and hate responsibly. But I think that's going to be just an absolute uh, madhouse of a game and and should be really fun to see on the field. And uh, it's bad for Texas, but it'd be good for college football if Texas needed a win to get to the SEC championship going into Kyle Field. I think that's just a whole lot of fun there at the end of the season. Yeah. All right. All right. How about this one, Parker? Because this one, this raised my eyebrow here. LSU, 9.2. Two seven expected wins here, and it's not that I'm doubting because heck, Brian Kelly's won ten games each of the, his first two years at LSU, but it's just it's very difficult for me to project that given their losses on offense, complete turnover essentially on, on the defensive coaching staff. Um, how do you, how does your model get LSU as as one of the top four winners in the SEC? Yeah, so a couple of things. One, some positive regression on defense. Uh, the way that LSU's recent history has gone and the way the transition matrix kind of sees how teams who are who are in LSU state year over year, I think they're not going to be as bad on defense. I think they made a good hire with Baker and uh, they certainly have talent. And so it's not an issue of, oh, can Baker get his guys in there? I think that's going to be an immediate boost on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, that being said, I think Garrett Nussmeyer could start a lot of places. He is not Jaden Daniels in terms of uh, being excited. And he's not going to have, you know, neighbors and, and Thomas there to just absolutely chuck the ball to. But that doesn't mean LSU doesn't have playmakers. That doesn't mean on offense that, that Nussmeyer is not going to be able to go through his progressions. Uh, it'll be interesting stylistically because I think that they're going to play a lot more in structure than they did last year. Uh, whereas, you know, Jaden Daniels off structure, um, kind of, kind of a, a little bit chaotic. Although I think his reputation for that is a little overblown. He was really good when he hit the routes that were open. I think they'll be able to dial up a lot for Nussmeyer. And uh, even if he can't create with his legs like Jaden Daniels could, which is a high bar, that's not a knock on Nussmeyer at all. Uh, I, I, I'm high on him and I think their offensive consistency will stay pretty high, even if it's not explosive. Um, the two California schools in the non-con, they'll be pretty heavily favored in both of those. Um, and, uh, you know, they get Ole Miss in, in Death Valley. They uh, get uh, Alabama at home as well. Um, and then to end the season there, you know, you've got a, a breather for Vanderbilt before Oklahoma gearing up for potential SEC championship or, or playoff game there. So with LSU schedule is schedule is kind of nice there. And, and I like Nussmeyer a whole lot. I think that the defense will regress positively and uh, and we'll see a different but but similar quality offense from LSU this year. Mm -hmm. And then here's the one I really had an issue with here. Ole Miss nine point one. And it's funny. Because 9-3, and three, historically, that's one of the best seasons Ole Miss has ever had, if that were to be their record. If they, they go 9-3 and three this year, Parker, with that schedule, with the talent, with, with Lane Kiffin running his mouth like you know he's going to do week in and week out, those fans are going to riot. So uh, what is it about the Rebels that, uh, that maybe – because I think they, they could legitimately win, win a national championship. I truly believe that. Now, they, they're not a favorite to do it or anything like that, but uh, that, this number really jumped out to me. Mike, I was trying to steal myself because I wanted to come on this show and say with a straight face, going to surprise some folks this fall. And them being an Ole Miss' non-con is just really going to throw things out. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, they've got a really easy non-conference. And you know as well as I do that I like if they don't if they don't make the playoff at a minimum this year, they're going to have a problem with donors being – saying, hey, we we gave you all the money asked for. What are we doing here, right? What do we, I, I'd really go spend it on the tailgate then have to keep doing this nonsense. So, um, I mean, I think we'll see them be uh, undefeated headed into LSU. They'll certainly be big favorites in most of those games and, uh, and a, and, and a toss-up game at LSU favoring the home team. So I think that's where you see them kind of come down from that 
10 win threshold to more of that nine win threshold is that LSU game um, on the road, but Oklahoma, Arkansas, and then, and then uh, they travel to Florida to end the season there. That one is, I think a little bit closer to that 40, 60 range, as opposed to like a 75 or 80 range, or 80 range of win probability, even if I expect Ole Miss to be better than Florida here. So um I think as we get some more information about if Ole Miss's talent and their acquisition is going to land on the field, we'll, they'll they'll ramp up quickly in the metrics. I think this prior is a little bit conservative on the offense, but it is like you know, like you said, in recent history, uh, it does kind of say, hey, the, historically this is where this team has kind of been. So we're anchoring a little bit in the past as well. Um, I mean, I could very easily see them, you know, beating everybody but Georgia, splitting one of LSU and Oklahoma. Boom, you're ten and two in the regular season there. So, um, just below nine, I think makes makes a lot of sense with the uncertainty of whether it'll actually manifest where they can take that next step, and the fact that they just do have a couple of those tricky games there uh, with with LSU, with Oklahoma, with Georgia and Florida there at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a little surprising. I mean, I think Oklahoma is going to be pretty good in the SEC. A lot of people question it. Very difficult schedule, but your model's got Oklahoma 8.77 wins in their SEC debut, higher than a, a couple teams that would probably surprise a lot of people coming up here. Um, did that number surprise you for the Sooners? It did a little bit and not for any analytical reason. Like I'm comfortable saying Brent Venable's defense is going to be fine. I think, you know, Jackson Arnold on offense is good, but who's going to play offensive line for the Oklahoma Sooners? Like we're going to learn that here after, after the spring. But um, that was something that had me really, really worried is not the right word, but, but kind of concerned for Oklahoma in 2024. It's you don't want to be lacking an offensive line kind of as your sec debut, but um, they're non-con. I think they, they get a, a, a nice floor there just because two lanes falling off a little bit. Uh, Houston, not, you know, doesn't, doesn't look like they're returning a lot. doesn't look like in year one of Willie Fritz, they're going to be um, excellent there. So I think they're non-con kind of props them up and then if you look at some of the games that they have um they, they they did do okay they get tennessee at home um they do have to go to uh auburn but they have auburn and a bye before the cotton bowl before texas uh red river excuse me uh the you know the texas team that they've seen every year and are familiar with and then again before Ole miss they they have uh, south carolina at home so a little bit of breathing room maine at home before missouri so some breathing room for them as well that alabama lsu missouri alabama lsu with the bye in between is is really rough at the end there it wouldn't shock me if they were you know eight and one and ended up eight and four losing three of those last games wouldn't shock me uh at all to see them drop it. Their schedule is definitely backloaded, but they do have some breathing room. The biggest question for me for Oklahoma is offensive line. Oklahoma is a good team to bring up too. I haven't posted these because I don't know how to, I don't know how to communicate them super well. So I'm going to use you as a test experiment. I hope that's okay. But they're, sure. they're, these are, these are point estimates, right? So the model is basically saying like, Hey, on average, we think this is what's going to happen. But with that, there are these standard errors that kind of say, all right, the, the you know, there's a distribution of outcomes and it's centered it for, for Oklahoma 8.77 or whatever it is. And we think it's going to be within these ranges. And that changes for each team because there's more uncertainty for certain teams. Oklahoma does have a wider uh, bound. Most teams, it's going to be like within a win, within one and a half wins. Um, Oklahoma, it's, it's, it's two wins, um, on, on each side, there is a lot more uncertainty there. Part of that is kind of the level effect of them, uh, adjusting and just the volatility we've seen the last couple of years out of Oklahoma, when things go poorly, they've played really poorly. Um, and, and so they're, they're, they're one of the teams that has the highest uncertainty bounds for me just because of that recent instability as well. So, uh, that's a, another thing where, Hey, Priors are priors. It's what I'm thinking going into the season. It's not gospel truth, but it is a good first pass at how I understand what a team's going to be in the season. And as we get information, we'll update it and we'll we'll kind of squish those uh, uncertainty bounds a little tighter because we know what a team is a little bit more. Right, and I think that's perfectly fair, Parker, because uh, like you said, the offensive line, but both both coordinators changed over, and Oklahoma people think I'm just completely making this up or something. But uh, hey, the way I'm I'm hearing it. Brett Venables, if he struggles this year, they're they're moving on from him, believe it or not. So, I mean, he that would be three years, and he'd have one good year. Maybe that was a little bit of a fluke. So, again, I'm not saying he's on the hot seat, but he, he really needs to win this year. It's everything we said about Texas applies to Oklahoma as well with a, a new schedule, certainly a backloaded schedule. I mean, there, there's a lot of uncertainty with Oklahoma, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm higher on him than most. So I'm not, I'm not saying Brentables is, Venables is a bad coach, of course – 
I thought he might get fired last year too, but I thought they were, they exceeded my expectations by every measure. Yeah, it'll definitely, um, it'll definitely need to take care of some Malay, help to take care of some Malays if Venables, you know, puts up a good showing here. It's also hard because the, like, kind of like that problem I talked about earlier, Oklahoma's good seasons in the Big 12 have been 12 and 0, 11 and 1. I mean, they went to the championship six, seven years in a row. I mean, something absurd, right? And right. and that's going to change, especially with the expanded playoff. Nine and three is not a down year, whereas it has been for Oklahoma. Um, that's 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 going to be a recalibration too. So there certainly is that effect that they're battling with um, th this season too. Right, and, and then so next you got Tennessee eight point seven four. Would have loved to have seen that be just a shade over Oklahoma, but it, it is what it is. They're playing in Norman, it's a difficult slate here. But I, I think the vast majority of Tennessee fans would, they would, you know, at eight and four, I think they would view that as a disappointing season. But some some rather tough games on their schedule as well. Alabama at home, at Georgia, of course, they're going to probably be underdogs in in probably both of those games. I don't know, but uh, any surprise there? Tennessee eight eight point seven four. Yeah, that was a little bit lower than I than I kind of anticipated. I'm high on Nico. I think that he's going to really open up their offense and they're going to be able to throw some intermediary passes as opposed to just, you know, screens uh, from, from last year. <laughs> the thing that stood to me on their schedule, I don't think that NC state game is as easy as Tennessee fans are, are maybe thinking in their head. That one's actually, I have them on a neutral really, really close to 50, 50 there for, for NC state. I, I like the Grayson McCall transfer and Dave Doran's defenses are always good. That, mm -hmm. um, that one I think is really where, again, we're talking about levels of wins, right? That that's why they're in the eight range as opposed to the nine range it is if that was Southwest directional state, Tennessee would be nine, nine something wins, but having that NC state game, I think that's a little bit harder than, than maybe uh, some people are anticipating. And that's really the difference there. Their, their conference schedule, yeah, they go they go to Norman, um, but they get to Alabama at home and, uh, you know, Kentucky, Miss, Mississippi State um, at home as well, kind of before they go to Georgia. So I think their season is really well primed to, you know, survive Alabama and then make one big push to take a swing at Georgia. Exactly like you mentioned, maybe their season's on the line and Georgia's got things wrapped up. There's some motivation differential, but I think that's what we're looking at at Tennessee season you know, first time starting quarterback, he's certainly hopefully going to progress as, as time goes and get better. And you're hoping you're walking into Athens um, at the end of the season, ready to actually just take your best swing at Georgia and, and pull off something crazy. Any concern in your mind though, that let's say they go eight and four or God forbid seven and five or worse that Josh Heupel was a little bit of a one hit wonder and just, and just kind of caught lightning with some, some high end quarterback and receiver play. Yeah, it's really hard there. Just, I mean, they they did have some dudes, absolutely, and 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 that's kind of the big way to eval uh, college football quarter or coaches is, hey, what what happens after the first recruiting class? And and in some ways, you know, that's what Kirby Smart's facing right now. New, you know, new quarterback, new receivers, new linebackers, um, as well, and he's recruited really well. But for for Hypo, I think it's less. I don't think there's anything about Josh Heupel that I that I don't know right now in terms of what he is as a quarterback. And so if they go seven and five this year, I'm going to say, yeah, man, new quarterback. They're kind of figuring out some kinks. Maybe they need to add a wide receiver in the portal. Maybe the defense took a step back, made a big improvement from 21 or 22 to 23. Maybe the defense took a little bit of step back. I can explain that away. But I mean, I, I don't think anyone in the world is deluded to the point of, you know, Tennessee is going to become the next Alabama or, or Georgia or something with that year in, year out consistent success. I think Josh Heupel is somebody who's shown that he can get the right guys that he wants build them up and develop them into a team that competes pretty consistently and keep the floor high in the off years. So um, I, I I think that, it, it, you know, it would be a disappointment if they didn't win eight games this fall. I think I can, I think we can all agree on that. And from Tennessee fan perspective, but if they didn't, I I, I don't think that's saying, Oh, Josh Heupel is never going to work. I'm saying this is kind of what you signed up for. He needs to develop this guys. And they just, you need the right combination of development cycle and luck and schedule to hit in the same year so that you can go have a, a run where you're, you know, deep into the playoffs, looking at the sec championship. Well, that's a very rational take, but we are irrational people down here. It's playoff or bust for about half this damn conference moving forward, and, and one that is when, a prime example, when Alabama. When the South Carolina fans start talking about playoff, that's how you know you're dealing with crazy town, right? Like <laughs> so people people are wondering, are you taking a cue from me trashing Alabama on Fine Bomb Show? Here we got Alabama, 8.55 expected win total. And uh, again, you're not the only one. I mean, I mean, basically every model that I've seen, 
has got Alabama at eight and four, which I, I guess you know technically is a little bit better than eight and four. But uh, mm, I mean, how, how's that going to go over well if if Kalen DeBoer goes eight and four this year? Can I tell you? Can I take a quick detour to tell you a quick secret right now? Sure. Anyone doing numbers with public data because of what public data has been constrained to in terms of what they have is doing the same thing. They're being like, what were you last year? What's returning production? What's this year? I know some people have fancier models. Some people are writing more code, whatever. But most of the time when somebody really stands out, um, it's one year, they kind of got the bounces and their model did pretty well. Uh, and, uh, and it's, it's not replicable. It, it is, you know, everybody who's doing public numbers is going to be in a, in a generally reasonable range. So it makes sense that there's some agreement there because it is the, you know, the fundamentals for Alabama are, um, are, are, are not there. They're 116th in returning production. So anything that includes returning production is going to pull it back. Their offense last year wasn't elite. It was just great. Um, so it was in that five to 10 range points above average, not that 10 plus range. Uh, and the defense struggled with some consistency there as well uh, down the stretch. So I, I certainly like Kalen DeBoer. He's one of those guys who's, whose resume speaks for itself. They've won at every level. Um, is is Milro the kind of guy that can run his offense? Uh, maybe. I think there, Michael Penix has some intermediate, has, has a better deep ball than Jalen Milro, but has some intermediate talent. Uh, that Milro didn't have. I think Milro is a much better rusher. So how are they going to kind of mix those together and, and build that out? They're obviously going to be stacked on defense. They're going to have guys. The offensive line should be much better. Jalen Milro is not going to be having to do backflips to catch the snap, uh, hopefully this season as well. So this is another one where we've got some high uncertainty bounds just because recent history is so good, but returning production is so low, it's a new regime. Um, and, and so when I look at Alabama, I think uh, almost, this is going to get me killed. I'm going to come on your show and get me, get me killed for saying something like this. This is all, this is why Alabama and Texas A&M are so close together because they're almost in the same situation where they're going to be more talented than basically everyone on their schedule, uh, aside from Georgia and everyone in their conference, aside from Georgia. And if it clicks, yeah, it makes sense. I can absolutely see Alabama winning ten games. If it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I can see the areas where they're going to struggle there. So wide uncertainty bounds there for Alabama, just because what does the post saving era look like? We don't know, but we know they do have talent. Uh, and so they should be favored in, in, in most of their games this season. Yeah. Well, perfect segue to next team, A&M 8.4. So right there with Bama first, uh, season under Mike Elko, of course, got rid of uh deadbeat Jimbo here. So I, I mean, if, if A&M, let's say they, to your point, I mean, that, it would not be uh, unbelievable if they go ten and two. I don't think anyone's going to be predicting that. But but again, it's not unrealistic. If they do something like that, will that just highlight what a clown Jimbo Fisher was even more? Yeah, I think it definitely speaks to the uncertainty that he introduced <laughs> to the program. Um, and I mean, it it is hard to just they, they had some bad injury luck. I, I think you can say that with 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 Jimbo as well. But like. You can, you can put all the Jimbo stuff in a box and say, even if they were being coached perfectly, they had some bad injury luck that really things were unstable at the quarterback position. I like Klein. I like Wagman. I, I, I feel like they could do a really good job of, I mean, with this talent, all Mike Elko has to do is say, all right, follow the rules on defense. Nobody be an idiot. I don't know what the thumbs, the thumbs up is happening there. I don't know if you saw that. I don't know if it's something, there's something on my computer, um, but really, really like it, it's, it's almost like the, you know, the, the office quote where Dwight is like, Michael told me, don't be an idiot. Hurts my feelings, works every time. That's what he, that's what he needs to say. He's like, you're more talented. Let's play in structure. Let's go win these games. That's what I'm really looking for out of Texas A&M. I, I do expect them to get better towards the end of the season. Um, there that that Auburn game, I think they like if things are going well, they should be they should be favored on the road at, at Auburn. Absolutely. By the end of the season, whereas I think going into the season, looking at the markets, they they probably won't be. Um, but yeah, I mean, after that kind of, you know, Missouri and LSU early, I think the back half of the schedule is extremely manageable and similar to Tennessee. You know, if you're not going to go to the playoff, the best thing you can do is knock your rival off the ladder. So huge, huge stakes on the line for Mike Elko. They could win six games, one of those being Texas, and he is good, right? And that's really all they need out of this. So uh, I look for for Klein on offense to impose some structure, playing in space, getting those guys uh, a chance to to say I'm faster and stronger than you, and we're gonna we're gonna dominate that. I think he's really good at matchups. Elko on the defensive side, cleaning up some of the run fits, limiting some of the big plays, uh, and you walk into you know you you host your rival at the end of the season and uh, and hope to again hope to pull off something crazy there. I, I think that's the formula for Texas A&M uh, this this fall. And and uh, pardon my ignorance, I, I know he's he has a tremendous reputation, but I didn't watch much Kansas State football. 
other than when they played they played Missouri the last couple of years. I think they played one an SEC team in a bowl game. But uh, can, can you give a quick summation of, of what Colin Klein is on offense? Yeah, so so one the Kansas State has a bunch of very good mobile linemen, uh, athletic linemen. So they're going to pull those guys a lot. Uh, you'll you'll see some sweet motion. Some of that is colored by Deuce Vaughn uh, a couple of years ago, where you know it was it was the Emmett Smith offense. It was throw the ball to Deuce, hand the ball to Deuce, pitch the ball to Deuce. But in absence of Deuce Vaughn, they did a really good job of RPOs. So you're going to see a lot of um, potential quarterback run game if 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 Connor can hold up to it, and um, you're you're going to see some RPOs there. You're going to see a lot of gap running, and uh, I. It's not the it's not going to be the dink and dunk that we've seen out of some of these athletic quarterbacks where they're either throwing a screen, they're running or they're or they're chucking it. There's going to be intermediate. They want to get their fast wide receivers on those slants, that glance RPO. They want to make you respect the run. Um, and so it's not going to be fancy. It's not going to be bells and whistles, but it's going to be, you know, jet sweep motion for the leverage. One guy that I think is really interesting from from last year. I want to see who who kind of fills this role was Ben Sennett. They um they submitted him for awards as a fullback, so he got recognition, but he was a tight end, super versatile guy, lined up at tight end, but would go to the backfield, would be out at the slot, uh, caught some touchdowns, caught some, you know, in, in, in the red zone was really valuable. Uh, and I think that just speaks, you know, he had Deuce Vaughn, who's super small, super fast, kind of open space back. Then, you know, Ben Sennett, a guy who's uh, a little, little chunkier, blocking sometimes. He was able to find an offense that worked for both of them. So I'm excited to see him play with the tools and see Texas A&M kind of have a come to Jesus, back to basics moment on offense instead of, you know, Jimbo Fisher's 9,000 page playbook that has every audible that, that could potentially even be called anywhere in any situation. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, next, you got Auburn 7.36 mm-hmm. expected wins and, uh, Man, he's got the gang back together. I mean, it's basically Ole Miss coaching staff 2.0 here from from back in the day, minus Matt Luke, of course. But uh, I I don't know. I I'm kind of out on Auburn. Um, does this number surprise you at all? Yeah, I don't like this at all. I I could see them losing the Cal game, man. If they don't do something at quarterback, what, how are they going to score points? Um, I think that's the biggest issue for me. Is the, is the, unless they make some waves here with a little bit of. Um, uh transfer portal in the spring if somebody becomes available i don't even know who that might be but yeah i'm i'm just not super optimistic i think the reason they're there is they do have um they get vanderbilt and arkansas um and kentucky so they're you know they're they're, they're gonna be competitive in those games in terms of the power ratings uh but yeah I, I i don't love this one i think this one is a little bit too high for me even to have them in the mid sevens i i would be comfortable with them under seven just because um i mean the offense they, it, there, there was no, it wasn't even dink and dunk. It was, can one of the quarterbacks throw it to save his life? Or are we just going to be able to run the ball? And the SEC, I mean, you just can't run the ball like that. So um, I, I I wonder if if they're going to be able to bring somebody in. I wonder if they're going to be able to squeeze much more out of Peyton Thorne uh, other than what we've seen in the past. So this is definitely one that stands out to me. Is like, eh, this is a little stinky. This feels a little high here. Mm-hmm. Now, how about Kentucky? 6.62 expected win total. And this is a team... Uh, I mean, the, the over-under, I believe, is only six and a half in Vegas. So um, I, I believe, you know, you, you take away the COVID year. That was such a such a weird year. But they've, they've won more than seven every year going back to 2017. So this would be a, a low mark for Mark Stoops and company, but not that I necessarily disagree. Uh, thoughts on, on that number, given the uncertainty with a new offensive play caller, new quarterback, and, uh, you know, they, they can't seem to get the offensive run right to save their lives. Yeah. Last year, in terms of, you know, offensive and de- uh, offensive efficiency, they were 93rd in passing efficiency, 79th in, uh, in rushing, um, and, and their defense, it was very good against the rush top 30, uh, but they were 99th in raw EPA expected points added against passes last year. So that, that is not really kind of the Stoops identity there. I felt like their offense or their defense had some leaks, even as their offense couldn't figure out a passing game to save their life. You know, Ray Davis, a lot of that was yards after contact. He, um, like, uh, Rodriguez, uh, before him was really good at yards after contact, wasn't getting as many opportunities kind of in space before contact. I, I need to see them generate a run game that doesn't rely on a running back, making Herculean efforts. Uh, Brock Vandergriff is a nice idea. I think that was a good swing by them. But we've seen them have quarterback talent of all levels the last couple of years and and really have been a manifest. They have offensive coordinator instability. Um, Kentucky's a team that just feels like 
in the old SEC with the SEC East was able to kind of tread water and and flirt with that third and fourth in the in their side of the conference and then maybe stick somebody and get to that second. But uh, in the new kind of divisionless team, I'm just not sure that the vision for Kentucky is really going to translate to consistent uh, consistent success. Uh, not predicting anything crazy here, but watch out for Ohio on this schedule. I think that's a better game than people think for, for the non-conference. They're a team with a really, really good defense last year um, and, and and showed some flashes of offense. They returned some this well uh, this year. So uh, I, I think that Kentucky is is just kind of poised to be middling in the SEC this year. And that's, that's a little bit rough to say, a little bit harsh. But, uh, I mean, maybe Vandergriff hits a home run and, and, and turns into, you know, a great quarterback. I'm kind of under the impression that if he was – his asset value was that high. I, I don't know that he would be at Kentucky relative to Georgia, uh, kind of with how things shook out. So, um, yeah, we'll see what they can do on the offensive side. But uh, I'm I'm skeptical until they can create yards before contact and then come up with some kind of vision for a passing game that, that's going to provide them some consistency. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to your point on the schedule, I mean, it's they they got Georgia, Texas, Ole Miss, Tennessee. I mean, they, this divisionless SEC is not doing Kentucky any favors. Yeah. Yep, it is. Uh, it's hard, man. It's a wake up call for everybody. <laughs> now, how about South Carolina six point two six? That's actually a lot higher than than many people would project. Uh, does that stand out to you that uh, Shane Beamer and company could potentially have a better year than expected? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that again, with it being a little conservative on the win totals, they're getting a little more credit. Um, I, I want to see what they can do with Nick Harbor, man. I'm sure you guys have talked about it on the show, but I mean, absolute freak track star, like what, 240 and is setting records for the 600. I mean, just absolutely fun. I think there's like three highlights of him last year out of the slot, absolutely torching a dude. I'm excited about that. Um, I, I think we'll see a shift in offensive uh, philosophy here with, um, I'm totally blanking. Who's a new quarterback? Help me out there. Uh, it's going to be probably Sellers, Lenora Sellers. Yeah, L- Lenora Sellers. I had the L, but I was like, Leggett's the receiver. Yes, with Lenora <laughs> Sellers. Um, I'd expect him to see if, if if they're going to play a little more like jet sweep, QB read kind of short game ball, and then see if they can hit a home run to one of these wide receivers um, on, on offense. The thing, the knock that I've had about South Carolina the last couple of years is that with with Beamer, and, and he's not as guilty of this, you know, as uh, maybe, maybe he has been in the past, it seems like they focus – on things other than kind of the down to down business of being good at football. So they can dial up a big play. They run the special team stuff. They drill the special team stuff and they rely on it. And when that all works great, but it really feels like there's just, it, it just on a down to down basis, South Carolina does not consistently under, under Beamer put out a team that, that is going to be able to compete week in week out with teams that are more talented than them. And when they don't get the positive variance last year in the run game on offense, they were 131st in EPA per play. We're all not opponent adjusted, but still bad. Um, and then on defense, they were 80th and 70, 80th overall, right? Just, I mean, just not good enough numbers there consistently down to down to be even be able to play the style of football that you want to play, which is hard nose, low possession, get that, you know, get get those special teams working in your favor. I feel like they, they, they really have to figure out the basics. And so I, I can see them with sellers kind of running more QB run, put their offensive line in a position to succeed rather than, you know, a five on five drop back kind of pass rush to situ- or uh, pass rush situation um, there. So interesting to see what they can do, how they can utilize the tools. I think we'll see a dramatic shift on offense from them for sure. Yeah. And I think he just hit the nail on the head because this may not make sense logically, but because I think Spencer Rattler was outstanding last year, given what he had to work with. I, I think he's he's kind of like a hidden gem for the upcoming draft, potentially. But losing an elite player with Sellers, they also added Robbie Ashford, the transfer from Auburn. Uh, that gives me an indication of, of, of what they want to do with the quarterback, more of a running, like you said, get him on the move. It, you know, I, th- I think silver lining is you lose an elite player, but maybe you got a quarterback that fits more of what you want to do, more compliment. Because it's been, it was literally just Spencer Rattler playing hero ball the last two years, and, and yep. that didn't work more often than not. Which is great, but if you put a Ferrari in my garage tonight, I'm going to crash it tomorrow, right? Like, I need, <laughs> I need to drive my Jeep. I can't do that. And so I think that's totally true. And, uh, yeah, Spencer Rattler lands in the right environment. Wouldn't surprise me to see him find a, find a job in the NFL. Absolutely there. Um, also obligatory, Robbie Ashford is so fast. 
Um, I, yeah, he's he's fun to watch. I, I don't know if he could throw the ball well at all, but could be interesting if they're doing QB run. They could do some stuff like Kansas did when Jalen Daniels and Jason Bean were healthy and you have a couple quarterbacks on the field. You're running some weird looks and trying to gin some stuff up. That could be a lot of fun, too. Mm -hmm. Now, the Florida Gators, 6.07. This is actually higher than the over-under. And, and I say, hey, you miss a mark on this one. I am the only I love to make fun of Billy Napier more than anybody in the world. But I'm the only one on, on this island where I think Florida could be good this year. Their offense really started to come around last year. Graham Mertz, yeah, was kind of dink and duck all, all day long. But he was significantly better than I thought he'd be. They just added a five-star quarterback. Hopefully that doesn't uh, create drama in the locker room. Otherwise, they'll be dead wrong here. But they just need a pulse on defense. And I think we I think we have a quality team. I think we have the best Billy Napier team yet. A am I right or, or am I wrong, do you think? I, I absolutely uh, agree with you there. I think Graham Mertz got better as the season went on um, and definitely improved and kind of turned himself in quarterback. They need some stability on defense there. What I can't get around here is the way that the numbers have this – they're going to be favored. Miami, Miami, uh, they're not going to be favored. Uh, they're going to be favored one, two, three, four, five of their first six, seven games. So they, mm -hmm. you know, five and two, if they pull that off, Tennessee and Miami are the projected losses right there. You get a buy and then Georgia at Texas, LSU, Ole Miss at Florida State. I don't, I don't care if it's Billy Napier or Jesus Christ. Like you're not winning all five of those games, right? That's just so brutal with the schedule. And it's hard because of the prior, prior expectations. Fans are seeing Anthony Richardson in the NFL and saying, wait a minute, we saw that guy. Why weren't we amazing? What's happening here? But I do think they're playing better with structure. I think last year with Mertz, they resolved a lot of the spacing issues. Talk about hero ball. Uh, you go back and watch some of that tape with Anthony Richardson. He's throwing the ball and like three wide receivers are running into each other in the same spot. And, Wait a minute, guys. I don't think that's supposed to be happening here. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I, I think there's absolute world where Florida is much better from a power rating standpoint and they're still six and six here. Uh, six and six would actually look pretty good if – uh, right now, those last four teams are all top fifteen teams. There, there's a world where that could be half of the top five, uh, half of the top ten uh, at the end of their schedule. That's just absolutely brutal. And Florida fans are notorious for keeping expectations in check and understanding the nuance of <laughs> tough scheduling. So I'm sure no one will be pulling their hair out. But I really do feel for Billy Napier. I understand. Uh, I think he's done a great job of ignoring some noise of saying, "Hey, I've got a plan. We've got to build a vision. Let's stick to it." Um, it just, I, I, this schedule just might be too much, man. Right, and I don't know if you've seen this. I don't know if you f follow uh, Brad Powers at all. He's another one I, I highly recommend. Yeah. Vegas uh, uh, handicapper for 20-plus years. He said this schedule is the toughest he's ever seen while he's been handicapping, and he said a uh, uh, an average top 20 team would go 6-6 six and six against Florida's schedule, and safe to say Florida, at least today, not a top 20 team. They could be by maybe by the end of the year if the, with some big improvements, but – so, yeah, I, I get all that. Uh, yeah. All right, how about Arkansas? 4.74, so a little bit of a drop here. Uh, that, that ain't going to cut it for Sam Pittman and company. I I hate to talk like this. I love Sam Pittman. I would send my sons to play for Sam Pittman. I think he's great. I've really enjoyed his quotes and all of that. I, I feel like he's made a couple missteps here that are just too much. The program's not going in the right direction. Um, I'm, my, I'm, I'm from Memphis originally. My dad's a huge Arkansas fan. I'm a huge Arkansas fan. I want to see them succeed. I wanted to buy into Sam Pittman. Uh, it just, I mean, it really feels like there, there's not an idea of kind of any offensive vision here they go from kj jefferson to Taylor green that's a lateral move at best um and the defense i think is just kind of mired in, in a weird holding pattern right here their talent isn't great they're not doing great in the transfer portal i don't know what the selling point for arkansas is here and and frankly this is very harsh but from the standpoint of program building i think by firing him in october this year as opposed to at the end of last season you just put yourself behind for another 18 months with the recruiting cycle and getting that in there i think that's a really hard situation um pitman obviously a great offensive line coach obviously knows about running you know great programs but the job is really really hard and and sometimes decisions don't work out sometimes you get some bad luck i, I i'm just i'm really really disheartened at the state of arkansas football right now because it doesn't feel like they have the personnel to run the identity they want and it feels like they're losing the sense of identity that they had with Pittman originally there right well good news is Nick Saban's out there to be had just just throwing that out there once they fire Sam Pittman make, it, make him right. say no <laughs> <laughs> all right Mississippi State 4.67 and this is again 
Mississippi State fans, they get tired of being not mocked, but but predicted so low. But how in the me personally, I don't I don't know how you can do anything other than this with a first year head coach, a first year defensive coordinator, and, and virtually the entire roster is is kind of in flux. I I think the future could be bright, but I I think if you're saying it is bright, you're you're just kind of guessing. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I I'm not super high on Levy. Um, I think there are other people who run that style of offense better, um, generally. And so I, I, I don't love the hire. The roster turns over. They bring in Blake Shapin from Baylor, who, you know, two sport athlete in high school had some moments, but was wildly inconsistent. Uh, the value proposition for that offense is really, really tough saying, Hey, you, you struggled against big 12 defenses. Here's a slate of sec. Also your talent around you is going to be worse and your offensive line is going to be more inconsistent. That doesn't feel great. He so yeah, absolutely a growing pains year for for Mississippi State here. Um, you know, I, I in, in the new SEC in the NIL era, eternity can change at a coin flip. You know, uh, you you can the reversal of fortune can absolutely happen. Maybe Levy's the guy to do that in Starkville, help them get back to a place where they are, like they were under Mullen, for instance. You know, every three to four years, their development cycle hits, they're nationally relevant, they're winning those games, and then they're always competitive with the rival Ole Miss. Uh, I, th- this year is, is going to be really hard. I think I think this four number is a little generous. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of generous, Vanderbilt to close us out, 4.07. Uh, Parker, I, I mean, I think they're going to struggle to get to three, and I, I hate mocking Vanderbilt. I wish they were better. I wish I wish that wasn't like a basically an automatic buy in conference play, but that's what it is right now. They lost so many players because they – They've refused to go into NIL. Now they're they're into it. But uh, any surprise that your model's got it over four for Vanderbilt? Yeah, I think it's honestly a little confident on them versus Georgia State and Ball State um, in, the, in the non-con. And so that's kind of bolstering them. And then, you know, six games of 2% win probability or 20% win probability, that's going to give you 1.2 expected wins. So there's your fourth win there. Um, I will say in terms of Vanderbilt's quality, I like – Jerry Kill being in the building. I think that's a positive move. I think we've seen him go to multiple programs and raise the ceiling. Absolutely. Diego Pavia is an extremely fun football player. I don't know that he's an extremely good football player, but I know he's extremely fun. And what Vanderbilt's done at the quarterback position historically has been very boring. And this is decisively not that. So maybe you get some spring transfers in the, in the wide receiver room. Maybe you try to string together, hey, Vanderbilt's going to lose, but we're going to drop 30 on you and make it really annoying. That's a step forward in the right direction for Vanderbilt this season. That's what you're really hoping for with getting Pavia is some kind of spark of life. I like Clark Lee. I think what they're doing, um, the idea of like bringing Barton Simmons in and doing some player personality now is really smart. And it's just a really hard job. And it got way, way harder with the combination of NIL and then the the change schedule here so certainly in a hard position i don't expect anything huge out of them um i i think if if they go three and zero in the non-con here um then i think we're looking at okay do could vanderbilt stick somebody with pavi at quarterback yes i think that's where the fourth win kind of comes from is out of you know looking at kind of the lower tier of, of who they're playing kentucky auburn south carolina uh maybe that's one expected win between those three that's where that fourth win comes from Mm-hmm. All right, Parker, you've been uh, more than gracious with your time. So I really appreciate you. Again, you're a must follow stats. Oh, war. Can you tell the audience before you take off? Uh, where's the best place to find all your work? Yeah, Twitter's the best place. I'm I'm perpetually in that off-season state of, all right, am I going to, you know, mess around or whatever? I put some stats up on the website, cfb-graphs.com. That and Twitter are great places to find me. The BetUS podcast over on YouTube. If you search BetUS College Football, my face will pop up. Gary and Kyle are there. We have a good time. We're we're doing some off-season shows. Um, yeah, so so check me out there. And uh, uh, Mike, make sure you tell Shane hello for me next time you uh, next time you talk to him. <laughs> Absolutely, I will, brother. So, hey, I'll cut it right there. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, 